Bible is uh, totally unique, totally different than any books ever written, and it shows the the power that God has to move uh, people and to move uh, groups of people, commonly known as nations, to fulfill his desires, and he does that without forcing people. He does that without them going against their free will. And so um, that's where we're at. Daniel 2, we're at verse 36, and let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words, help us to, uh, as we meditate on your words, that we'd see, wow, the, the chance of these things coming true are slim and none, and it's practically impossible, and there's no uh, <clears throat> bookie in La Vegas that would even bet against our bet for odds like this, and it's amazing uh, how you work, and I do pray you'd help us to uh, admire your word and be in awe of the power that you have, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're up to Daniel 2.36. So far, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He forgot the dream. He asked his political advisors to tell him what the dream was and the interpretation, and they thought it was unreasonable that he would ask them to tell him his dream because he they don't know what he dreamed. But uh, we have a God in heaven that knows our mind, knows our thoughts, gives us dreams, and reads the dreams and all that stuff. And so he gave Daniel. Daniel was probably 20 years old at the max. So just think about a 20-year-old kid, 18-year-old kid, uh, something like that, about 20 years old. God gave him the dream. He went in and told Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, now I remember. And so then he says, what's the interpretation? Okay, so this is the interpretation of the dream. Uh, verse 31 to 35 is the actual dream. And so he's going to start interpreting it. Okay, now what this is going to introduce a new thing in history. This is called the Times of the Gentiles. Okay, Adam was more or less created a king on the world, and he was like the first king, but he only had Adam and Eve to start with. And then he passed that baton to Noah. So after the flood, Noah became like the king or the one that God worked through at that time, the dominion over the earth. And then he saw Abraham, so he made a deal with Abraham, gave him an agreement, and then... Uh, as time marched on, Moses uh, marched the Israelites out of uh, Egypt, and that became the first nation. Okay, a nation is nothing but a bunch of people, okay, generally of one race. That's generally what a nation is. It's usually one race of people, and the legal terminology in our con in a Declaration of Independence, which is the real highest law, Okay, that said, we the people, okay, the people in a, in a fashion like that without the S on the end is refers to one race of people. The United Nations says we the peoples with the S on the, on the word people, which seems like uh, redundant, but no, that involves multicultural, okay, that's the legal aspect of it. And so Israel had one people. And to be a citizen, you had to be a Jew. If a Gentile wanted to come along with them, they had to adopt their rules and their laws, and they became strangers in the land, foreigners, aliens. Uh, they were to be treated like the citizens. The citizens were not to have any separate laws or anything. Okay, so Israel became the first nation that God used as an example to all nations. So Israel became like a, a priest of all nations, all Gentile nations. If they wanted to, as a nation, wanted to fellowship with God, then they were to go to Israel and then discover how to do that. Okay, and that's what Israel is supposed to do. Well, uh, that went out okay from 14, about 1450 uh, B.C. until about 600 B.C. You have, of course, had the split from uh, Israel and Judah. And then in 600 B.C., Judah, uh, they, uh, God gives up on all that. Okay, so he takes it away from a guy named Jeconiah. 
Uh, and Jeconiah, the J-E at the beginning of his name, is the J, the short of Jehovah. So he takes that off. He, said, he calls him Coniah. And that's when he officially, officially took it away from Judah. And at that point, then uh, you had a couple puppet kings in there, Zedekiah, stuff like that. And then Babylon came in. And so the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, God uh, is now transferring world kingdoms to the Gentiles. Okay, if you would uh, hold your finger here in Daniel 2, go to Luke chapter 21. It's called the Times of the Gentiles. And so, <coughs> excuse me, who's running world kingdoms? today are Gentiles. The vast majority are Gentiles. Anybody's not a Jew. Uh, Luke 21, 24, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations. The they in this context will be Israel. You'll see Jerusalem in verse 20. And you'll see that they're supposed to run to the mountains, verse 21. So this is obviously a prophecy about the trib, tribulation. He says, they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay, well, that will obviously be the end of Daniel's 70th week. And then he restores Israel to its rightful position. So we're living in a time period called Gentiles. Another passage on that is Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Now, when I say Gentiles, uh, obviously the world kingdoms are, uh, uh, God has delegated world kingdoms to be under uh, Lucifer or Satan. And then he will pick the Gentiles that he wants to be international powers or whatnot. Okay, so this is what Satan offered Jesus during the temptations. Remember, he said, if you bow and worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms. So religion and politics. So this tells us some things. When people get international political power, okay, generally speaking, there's been a deal cut with Satan somewhere along the way. Okay, now the exception does prove the rule. The exception would be uh, King James. Okay, he's an exception to the rule. Uh, Bloody Mary is the rule. Okay, a bloody mirror, or Mao Zedong, or Stalin, or Fidel Castro, okay, those are the general rule of how it works, okay, when they get in charge. So you got King James and Queen Victoria were two exceptions, okay, and then Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Okay, that's today. Israel as a nation is blind to the scriptures, and they are the enemies of the gospel. Chapter 11, verse 28, that's Israel today. Okay, and then he says that the blindness of Israel is happen, or has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Okay, so again, there's the time to the Gentiles. Now, in Daniel 2, this dream with Nebuchadnezzar is going to introduce the times of the Gentiles, the beginning of it. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to be the first international king of the Gentiles. So, Daniel 2, verse 36, here's the interpretation. This is the dream, and we, that's Daniel's buddies, will tell... Our interpretation of the scramp charms. Okay, that's what everybody thinks. Everybody's got their own inter interpretation. Now, Daniel says, we're going to tell you the interpretation of the scriptures. Okay, thereof before the king. Okay, thou. Okay, remember TH pronoun, singular pronoun. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. So we know Jesus is the king of kings, but Nebuchadnezzar is a king of kings. He is the first international king that God's going to establish uh, of this dream. Okay, you're a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. 
Okay, God's the one that put them there. Power and strength and glory. Okay, so God is the one to put him there of this kingdom. In Daniel 4, remember, he forgets that. He forgets that, and then he gets into a nutcase for seven years. Okay, then he says in verse 38, now this is world kingdoms. He says, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field... And the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them. Thou art this head of gold. Okay, that's the dream. Okay, now, beast of the field, commonly known as wolves, canine. Okay, and so the idea of the beast of the field where political figureheads will operate as the beast or the dogs where other places it referred to as judges as ravening wolves. And remember what Jesus called Herod? That fox. Okay, so that's typical behavior of a political figurehead. Okay, that's, that's the rule. The exception does prove the rule, rule. And fowls of heaven. Now remember what birds picture in the Bible. Okay, the fowls of heaven. Okay, remember that birds picture spirits. A clean bird, a dove, pictures the clean spirit, the Holy Ghost. Unclean birds, ravens, owls, buzzards, and then small winged creatures, flies, mosquitoes, picture unclean spirits. So in this world kingdom, you have unclean spirits that's influencing what's going on down here on earth. Now, in Daniel chapter 10, we'll get into that one too, Daniel has this uh, uh, a vision where he sees that these angels up in the, in the heavens, okay, are fussing about some things back and forth, and then finally the answer to prayer came to Daniel. Okay, now that what that tells us is that what actually is influencing world politics is what's going on in the air. Okay, Jesus said he beheld Satan fall as lightning. So Satan got kicked out of the second heaven as his domain to the first heaven. So Paul says in Ephesians 2, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Okay, so that's where all the spiritual activity is taking place, in the air. Okay, and that's what's... You know, the radio waves and the television waves and all that stuff. And the devils are fighting the angels and all that's going on in the air. Okay? And now, that's not controlling world politics, but it does influence it. Okay? It, it doesn't, you can't say that Satan made me do it. People that say that Satan made me do it is a cop-out. Okay, now, granted, people will get bound in their sin. That's a different thing. But it's a strong influence. Okay, and this is why the most most patriotic thing you could do is to pray for your country. Why? Because you're influencing the heavens. And then what? Quote the scriptures. That's the most patriotic thing a person can do. Okay, those two things, because that hits up in the air. Okay, now, up in the air, they are what's influencing the spirit of an age. Okay, now, what's influencing the mind, the thinking of Americans is what we call the media. The television medium, Hollywood. Okay, the national news industry. Okay, the media. Isn't it funny the words they choose? Media as in medium, as in witchcraft. Okay, they're trying to influence people's thinking. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying they can control our thinking. It's a general form of mind control. Okay, and this last election, basically, I would say the number one vote that people voted was against the media. They saw who the media was pushing, who the media wanted. It was obvious. Okay, so that's why Hollywood calls it a TV program. They're trying to program our thinking. 
Now, what they're doing is they're desensitizing us to the LGB XYZ community agenda, okay, where we don't see how bad it really is. This woman's march, did you see any of the footage of this march? It was absolutely vulgar. I mean, it was X-rated stuff in public right beside children. What was the purpose of the march? They don't know what the purpose of the march was. It was just people being out in public, and they care for the environment. They trashed the whole area. You know, look, get, look at some of it. As adults, you can look at some of it, but boy, I, I clipped on this one thing. He said, got ten disgusting pictures of the woman's march. I saw two. I said, that's enough. I mean, it wasn't, it was just Hollywood pushing this garbage and they were doing this in front of children, little kids and everything. And that's because they're vulgar people. Now, those people are strongly influenced by the spirit of the age. And as a believer, we got to recognize the spirit of the age and walk contrary to it. Okay, that's where it says that David's mighty men, they understood the signs of the times. Do we understand them? Okay, so... The media, they try, they influence thinking, but they can't control thinking. The spirits in the heavens influence thinking, but they cannot control thinking because that's us of our free will. Now, most people will give in to it, okay, because they think it's, uh, you know, this idea where they get desensitized. So in, in this first kingdom, he says, the files of the heaven are given into thy hand. So the influence of this Babylonian kingdom were the spirits. Okay, there's a fellow who wrote a book a couple years, uh, a few years back, Frank Peretti. Okay, he's got some pretty decent, you know, there, he's got not the right Bible, and he's kind of got a little uh, stuff in there. But still the idea, you get the general idea, and it kind of motiv- motivates a person to pray when you can kind of visualize what's going on above us. Okay, but still the idea is thinking about that. So uh, Babylon becomes the head of gold. The head of gold becomes Babylon. That was Nebuchadnezzar. That lasted 70 years. Now that idea of 70 years was predicted by Jeremiah. Now, man, if they want to disprove a prophet, make it 71 years. Make it 72 years. Make it 69 years. But that thing landed right on 70 years as God prophesied through Jeremiah. And Daniel figured it out when he was about 85 or 90 years old because he was about 15 when he got in there. He was in Babylon for the 70 years. He read Jeremiah. Oh, wow. Then Media Persia comes in next. Okay, so Babylon today is modern day Iraq. So we see things haven't changed. Okay, the next kingdom is 39. And after this shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So it's a lesser kingdom. And another, a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Okay, this is over all the earth of that area. Okay, the second kingdom, uh, these two kingdoms are given by name in chapter 7. Okay, so they, they're given by name in chapter 7, verse, oh, let's see, 19, 20, 21, maybe it's 8. I'm sorry, it's 8. In chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. Okay, they're given by name, who it is. Okay, so the second kingdom is Media Persia. That's modern day Iran. Okay, then the next kingdom is Greece. Okay, back before Christ, that would have been Alexander the Great. Historians call him Alexander the Great. His private tutor was Aristotle. Alexander the Great was a chronic drunk by the time he was 15. He died uh, when he was 33. I don't think he was such a great man. So you have Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates... Two of the three were sodomites. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. I think Aristotle was a sodomite. 
okay, and a chronic drunk, Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great conquered the known world by the time he's 30, meaning he took the armies out and he conquered that all that region, okay, and that would have been Babylon or Iraq, Iran, Israel, the northern part of Africa, all around the uh, around uh, uh, Lebanon, Syria, modern day Turkey, okay, and then the little country of Greece today. It's very small today, but all of that was um, influenced by Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great wanted to have a great museum. Uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, because it was named after him, Alexandria, the city of Alexandria. They had a museum there as you're musing, thinking about things. They had a school there, uh, an unusual school and all that stuff. And that's where um, Origen started messing with the scriptures because the scriptures came from Israel down there. He didn't like some of the things. Origen, guy named Origen. I don't know if the state of Oregon was named after the guy. It's spelled a little bit different, but Origen was probably the first Bible corrector in a school down there in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, he was like a, his beliefs were similar to a modern day Jehovah Witness origin. Now, the scholars, oh, they think origin is a godly man. I think he's a scumbag. <laughs> okay, and then eventually Westcott and Horton, all that stuff. Okay, and that in Alexandria, Egypt, Alexander developed plans of a multicultural society that we could live in uh, harmony down there in Alexandria, Egypt, and of course that's where all the new Bibles, the manuscripts come through Alexandria, Egypt. Okay, after um, after um, Alexander died, the kingdom was split between four generals, and then uh, eventually after that, Rome conquered all of that region. Okay, and so Daniel chapter two, uh, you have verse thirty-nine, the inferior kingdom. Verse 39, the brass. Verse 40, the, king, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and uh, subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. So there's the rule for the world kingdoms. If you would go to Mark 10, verse 42. And then also Matthew. Okay, now how do Gentiles rule? Okay, they rule by lording it over people. Okay, we'd say dictator, tyrant, a bully. Okay, uh, Mark 10, verse 42. Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. Now, the founding fathers of our country understood this idea, and they wanted to try something new. The mysterious and amazing thing is to put the people in charge. And the way they want to do it, in fact, Thomas Jefferson told you know, said publicly that uh, the number one job of politicians is, or statesmen is what they call them more or less, statesmen is different than a politician, is to keep the people alert to the affairs of the governing structures. And they said, if we don't keep them alert, then we, referring to his crowd, will become wolves. I mean, that's what Thomas Jefferson warned them, third president. And boy, is that not true. Okay, and so the way they wanted to box in public officials is to, when they took the oath of office, is they sign an oath. They, they take the oath and then sign the oath and then purchase a bond through an insurance company. And that was to make them public servants under the people because Jesus said here, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever ye will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. And that's what became known in our country. Now, if you remind any of them about that, they sort of kind of get upset. But if they didn't want to take that position, don't take the oath. 
Okay, and if they, if they violate their oath, sue them on the bond. And then if they lose the bond, then they got to get kicked out of office. Okay, but how hard is it to do that? Okay, Matthew 11, verse 12. This is the standard. This is the standard of Gentile governing structures. Matthew 11, verse 12. He says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Okay, governing structures operate generally as a body in two fashions. Leviticus chapter 5 gives both of them. One is deception, and the second is force. Okay, now... Depends. In America, they use deception first, and when that doesn't work, force will come second. In the Oriental cultures, force is first, and forget deception. (laughs) They'll just force it right down their throat, generally in Oriental cultures, in communist cultures. Okay, and that's, that's the standard. That's the practice. Okay, so in Daniel 2, verse 40, uh, verse 40, we have an advantage of hindsight of looking backwards. Hindsight's twenty twenty, so we know that fourth kingdom is Rome. Okay, pagan Rome, pagan Rome, and that was the kingdom that Israel was subject to. Remember that Jesus said in uh, John eight thirty two, "And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free." And those Pharisees got mad, and they said, "What do you mean, make us free? We've not been subject to anybody." Right at that time, they were subjects in Rome. The most deceived people in the world are people who think they're free when they're slaves. And that's about where Americans are at. Okay, but still, uh, the idea of Rome is that kingdom, and then Rome was destroyed, and so then this next fifth kingdom is going to be a revised Roman Empire. So that's verse 41. And it says, whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So the feet of this dream was iron and clay. So we got the iron that will go with the legs. So that's why it's a revised Roman Empire. Okay, and so in Daniel 2, God reveals four worldwide kingdoms, and then the fifth one is the Antichrist. In Daniel 7, he gave three worldwide in- kingdoms, and the fourth one became the Antichrist. In Daniel 8, he had two world kingdoms, and then the third one was the Antichrist. In Daniel 9, he mentioned one kingdom, Rome, and then he jumps right into the Antichrist. And in Daniel 11, he just jumps right into the Antichrist. He takes that progression down all through there. Now, it's interesting that you'll see that the metals go from gold to silver to brass to iron to clay. Now, in our country, that's how the monetary value has gone. Okay, in 1892, there's a coinage act, and in that act, it defined what a dollar was. Okay, now, when we say dollar, we think paper currency. But a dollar is a unit of measurement. If somebody would say, give me a quart, we would say a quart of what? Because a quart is a unit of measure. A dollar is a unit of measure. In 1892, they defined, uh, not 1792, they defined... A dollar was so much weight of gold and so much weight of silver. That's what a dollar was since 1792. Until, until December 22nd, 1913, where a shadow, uh, a private corporation was created called the Fed. Okay, and, that's, and then the money supply started going down. Now, up until that time, Americans understood gold and silver, even if it was paper, Even if it was paper, you could take that piece of paper to a bank and get the coinage. It was equal value. In 1913, a private corporation was created called the Fed. Sounds interesting. Sounds federal, but it's not. It's a private corporation. 
And then if I, if I lay all the currency in front of you, which I have, you can see the deception. I've got 1928, 1932, 1950, 1963... I've got a, the three $5 bills in the 1960s. We have three different $5 bills because they had competition. Naughty, naughty, JFK did that, and then he got a bullet in his head from the back and the front, okay, depending on which way you want to go with it. Okay, he had three $5 bills in 1963, United States notes, Federal Reserve note, and a silver certificate. I've got all three of them. And as soon as LBJ got in charge after JFK died, he pulled all USA notes out. Why? Because that was competing with the feds. So FDR took the gold from Americans, where the gold currency was taken out. And LBJ took the silver out. And so then you've got the clad coins. 1965 is when all the clad coins started coming in. If you have a coin before 1965, 1964, keep them. You've got silver. Okay, we knew, a, we knew a, a, a friend of mine, his dad knew that these clad coins were coming in and he'd been collecting all these dimes and quarters in the 50s and he had so much of this stuff that they had to have a truckload in order to transfer his coinage from one bank to another and then he borrowed off those coinage. But, uh, and so now the coinage is, is nothing, it's of no value. So it went from gold to silver to brass, like the the uh, penny, not even copper anymore, to iron, that's what the coinage is today, you know, down to fiat currency, paper currency, it's clay, it's of no value. Now, we hold our currency, we think, oh, that feels like money. But when you go to Australia, their money don't feel like money. And when they come here, ours don't feel like money to them. It's all fake. Uh, I, think, I think Brent, uh, no, when Brent and I went to Vietnam, we were instant millionaires. Oh, it was amazing. We were so rich. I think we could exchange $100 and we got like a million in uh, Vietnam currency. Man, we were so rich. Okay, and you can buy anything for about seven bucks. There's one time, you know, Orientals, they, you know, you dicker with them, dicker with them, dicker with them. And so Mike Roberts was trying to get this item for me. And he's, you know, got the guy down to the price, and then I gave him the money. I said, keep the change. You know, he's like, oh, can, can, can. <laughs> it just drove him nuts. <laughs> okay, but uh, that's what's happened in our country is that it's gone. It shows that evolution is false, does it not? Devolution is true. It's the exact opposite. Okay, now in Daniel 2.43 is something very interesting. I'll just kind of tip the curiosity here. So we're talking about iron and clay. Now we know clay would be a portrayal of man, is it not? I mean, because we came from the dirt. 43, he says this, and whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with my clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Who's they? Well, the iron and the clay, we see the clay is the men because the parallel. But who's they? That's something very strange. Okay, and this is something that the Bible t writes about, talks about. And this is you going back to Genesis chapter 6, where you have the fallen angels, the sons of God, coming into the daughters of men. Clay, sons of God, aliens, you know, so-called aliens, having relations with women, having a product that becomes mighty men of renown. Something that may or may not have a living soul, as we do, because you don't know what it is. It's uh, like a lizard walking around that appears to be men. Okay, and there's much of this you can, you know, kind of research it. I wouldn't take a whole lot of time. But these beings usually get in powerful places, masquerading as flesh and blood men, and may not be men. Okay, Remember what Pharaoh, he described Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh and, the, and Moses going back and forth? Ezekiel says Pharaoh was a dragon. 
And you see, this throws the Calvinists for a loop because they, they say that Pharaoh, God hardened his heart, you know, and he didn't have a choice in the matter. Yeah, but what if Pharaoh wasn't a man? What if he was one of these products that cannot come to Christ because they don't have that capability? And he's masquerading as a man. Pharaoh is a red dragon, where Satan appears in his natural state as a dragon, but when he appears to men, he appears as an angel of light. He appears as a man. He can shapeshift. And do we have these beings walking around on our earth? Oh, you most certainly we do. Now, there's, there are some people who will ma major on these ministry. I don't think you ought to major on it, but I think you ought to know about it. And I think that it also it tells us we are not to put our hope in any government official. Our hope is not in any government official at all. Yeah, I was glad Trump got in rather than Hillary. But very glad. <laughs> Okay, but my hope's not in him. My hope is in praying against the spirits up here and teaching the Bible against the spirits up here because that is what influences a nation. Okay, and when we start dropping that, then everything starts going. So the hope in a nation is not politics. The hope of a nation is, is in the pulpit, the preaching, in the praying. That's where the hope of a nation is. So in verse 43, we got something very unusual, okay, and that would go into the Antichrist kingdom where you have the ten demoniac kings that give their authority to the Antichrist. Now, I knew for years the evangelicals, as they taught prophecy, they take them ten toes, and they talk about the European Union, and, oh, we got eight members of the European Union. When we get ten... Oh, we know it's coming. And then they had 11 and 12. And that would be Goliath, 12, you know, six toes on each foot. Uh, and then 13. It's not Europe. Europe's not, is out of the picture. The Middle East is where the picture's at. And those 10 toes are those 10 demoniac kings of Revelation 17. And those will be <clears throat> controlling Muslim nations. The ten Muslim nations around Israel, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Egypt, Morocco, Libya, those, that's the old Roman Empire all around that. Greece, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. Those are the ones that's going to be brought back up to be restored. Not Europe's, man... Europe's out of the picture, <laughs> as far as that goes. Okay, so that's Daniel. And then, uh, and of course, um, the glorious thing, verse 44 and 45, where Jesus comes back. Okay, so the final kingdom is his, verse 44, where it says, And in the days of these kings, okay, that's the they of verse 43, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, that's the Lord's, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So the logical thing is everything's falling apart, and Jesus is going to come back and fix it. Instead of the church is getting stronger and stronger and stronger, then Jesus will come. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a very optimistic person. A post-millennial is nothing more than an evolutionist with a Bible. It's all that he are. Okay, and then verse 44. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what should come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Okay, now we know that stone will be the great cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And he's going to hit it in the feet. If you take somebody's feet out from under them, they're going down. I don't care how big they are. Okay, so verse 44, 45, that's the greatest kingdom of the Bible. That's the most important doctrine of the Bible. That's the second coming of Jesus. Okay, we'll stop there.